Okay, so this is treating documentation like code, a practical account. Are you going to work? There we go. I am Jody Petrino. I am a senior technical writer at F5 Networks. I am an extrovert. I'm sure there's a couple more of us here, but I know we're like in the minority in this community, so I thought I'd point that out. Um, I'm friendly, come talk to me. I won't force cuddle you, but you know, you can come talk if you want to. Uh, I'm an outdoor enthusiast, and I've included this picture of this lady here because I consider her my spirit animal. Um, I just, I love her casual demeanor, I love her typewriter, I love her bike, I love her top knot, and I like to think of her in modern times wearing jeans and a t-shirt and basically everything else is exactly the same. <laughs> uh, a couple more important things about me, um, I am an ex-software development noob, and I am no longer completely and blissfully unaware of Git. <laughs> Um, so I've been working at F5 for about two years now. I came from medical publishing where I managed peer review. So when I was interviewed for my job at F5, they asked me if I was comfortable with Git, and I said, what's Git? <laughs> I know what it is now. <laughs> um, so my knowledge of software development processes and tools when I started working at F5 was basically non-existent. We started working on a couple brand new products, and um, as part of the planning for those, the team of software engineers and architects came up with a list of awesome future ideas for documentation that would be developed, tested, and built just like the code. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. It's pretty great. Um, so let's take a minute to talk about what that actually means, because um, treating docs like code is basically a buzzword bingo term these days. It's like Hansel, it's so hot right now. Um, but it does actually mean something, it's not just a pretty phrase. Um, at the forefront of our grand vision for treating the documentation like the code was that the docs would live in the same repositories as the code, follow the same development and code review processes, and use a continuous delivery model. Um, <laughs> yay, continuous delivery. Um, so now that we know what it actually means, we should also talk about why. Why would you want to do it? Um, it helps keep the docs in lockstep with the development process. Uh, we all know that you can very easily run into a situation where the product is ready to release, and oops, nobody forgot about the docs, or nobody thought about the docs, so now we have to scramble for the next 48 hours to figure out how we're gonna tell people to use the product that we've just built so we can get the release out on time. And that's not fun for anyone. Um, it keeps you thinking about the documentation throughout the development process instead of an afterthought. It lets the subject matter experts, and I can't, I can't say SME without thinking of Peter Pan, so I just avoid it. Um, <laughs> It lets the subject matter experts share their knowledge when it's fresh, instead of two months after they develop that feature and they're on to like three other things and they just honestly don't care anymore. Um, and it also helps you keep the instructions for using the product with the product they're describing. It's a novel idea. So now that we know what it is and why we'd want to do it, <laughs> thank you for giggling. I love South Park. Um, just as a quick side note, my brain works in um, movie and television show references, so they may or may not be smattered throughout the presentation. Um, so we know that we want to develop docs like code and at phase three profit, obviously, but how the hell are we supposed to get there? Um, Working on entirely new products for F5 gave us an opportunity to design entirely new ways for the company of documenting them, which was really awesome to have that opportunity, but it was also really frustrating because, remember, I have no prior knowledge of software development processes and tools, so I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, it was really, really hard for me to find any publicly available information about how I was actually supposed to accomplish that goal and bring up all of our awesome future ideas to life. Um, Ann Gentle's book wasn't out yet. <laughs> it is now, I haven't read it yet because I didn't, I didn't want to accidentally steal her ideas from my presentation, but I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I found a lot of valuable resources online, including past Write the Docs presentations, 
Um, and they dealt with the theory of the idea or argued in favor of or against treating the docs like code, but nothing actually outlined any best practices for me. What tools should I use? How do I test things? Where do I publish? Um, I, had, I spent a lot of time just basically, you know, Googling and trying to figure out what it was exactly that I was supposed to be doing, which was fun, but it wasn't necessarily that productive. Um, so I'm going to summarize for you guys uh, how we actually got there. Guys and gals, sorry, not trying to be sexist. Um, how did we get there? Um, I intend to lay out a roadmap. So you don't have to make any of the mistakes that I made. You can make your own new mistakes um, from a starting point further down the road than where I started. So what we learned is that um, it's important to choose the right tools for your project. I spent a lot of time investigating different static site generators and publishing platforms, and um, eventually landed on Sphinx because we were working on a Python project. We started publishing on Read the Docs and then eventually had to move to AWS um, S3 as our static site host because uh, security. Um, F5 has some really, really stringent security requirements that um, they basically were like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, we also learned that automation is key. You automate what you can to give yourself the freedom to focus on the things that you can't automate. And let me get my pointer over here so I can scroll down my notes. I could hum a little tune for you while I do this. <laughs> oh, there it is. OK. Uh, so you automate what you can to give yourselves the freedom to focus on the things that you can't. Um, collaboration is a huge thing. This is one of the core principles of the development teams that I work with. We spend a lot of time working out the best way for everyone to contribute to the documentation. And that's not necessarily going to be the same from project to project, and that's totally fine, because remember, it's do what's right for your project. Um, the key is finding out what works best for everyone to make sure that everybody's happy and you know, nobody's going to B-I-T-C-H and complain of that they're being expected to do things that they don't think they should have to do. Um, <laughs> I'm just laughing because I just censored myself. Uh, we learned that it probably would have been better to have a clearer picture of the end result at the beginning instead of making decisions, designing, and implementing all at the same time, and not necessarily in that order. Um, but hey, we're agile, so we can do that, right? That's, <laughs> that's how agile works. Um, but the key is that we know that we don't know everything, and we're willing to adapt, because we're still honestly having discussions about how we can do things better, we have discussions about versioning seemingly every other week. <laughs> and um, the, the point is that we know that there's always going to be some shiny new thing out there that is going to allow us to do things better. And we want to be able to use them uh, without you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So now that I've learned all of these things, I get to share them with you. So this slide is a basic overview of our um, tools and workflow. The write and review stages are the only ones that are done manually. Testing and deployment is all done automatically. And we're using a few different CI tools for test and deployment, depending on where the projects are developed. We do things in GitHub, and we do things on a private internal GitLab server. So for GitHub, we're using Travis CI internally. Uh, for the GitLab stuff, we're using GitLab CI. Um, they basically. They do the same thing. You have to set them up in very marginally different ways. Um, but the nice thing is that we have developed a tool set that can be used in either place, so we're guaranteed consistency no matter what the build platform. So uh, to delve a little deeper into it, for writing, we're using RST. I will I'll allow Markdown for simple projects to not scare away developers, but um, basically, because it doesn't have the robust tool set that RST has, um, if you're working on a project that needs the full Sphinx feature set, you're going to be using RST, which also means that if you're working on a project that I am in charge of the documentation for, you're going to be using RST. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we commit our changes and push everything up to GitHub eventually. Um, when you push your changes up to GitHub, and remember I said we use GitLab too, but I'm just going to say GitHub throughout so I don't have to say both. Um, the important thing is that it's Git. 
when you push everything up to GitHub, that automatically deploys a series of tests, um, which I will get to in a moment. So for review, you open a pull request, you assign the appropriate reviewer. For us, that might be the developer that was responsible for the bulk of the features you're describing. Um, it could also be the support person who works on those products. Um, he regularly reviews my content. His name is Rick Salsa. He's totally awesome. Uh, he brings up things that I never would have thought of, so collaboration between the two of us always makes our documentation better. Um, if it's a developer who uh, wrote the documentation, they would assign me as their code reviewer, and um, I actually would go in and check out their branch and make my edits there and commit them so they can review my changes to their content to make sure that I didn't completely screw up the meeting. <laughs> and then um, the, the technical code reviewer can merge that pull request whenever all the other bugs are fixed. So for testing, as I said, we're using Travis CI from GitHub, um, but no matter uh, which place we are running the tests, we're all running the same tests. Um, we use a Docker container image that we developed internally that has all of the depend uh, dependencies for the documentation built in. Um, this is the script that launches the Docker container. <laughs> Yay, containers. Uh, I, I should also add that like this is the products that we develop are containerized products, therefore containerized environments. So there is not a one developer in my office that does not use Docker on a daily basis. Um, so the primary reason for wanting to create a series of scripts that we could run easily in Docker was that they wouldn't have to remember a lot of complicated things about how to use a specific documentation tool set, and they wouldn't have to install anything that might be in conflict with whatever the dependencies of the project they're working on are. All they have to do is run make doc test, and we do the rest in the background. So we use the Docker container. We uh, run the doc script inside the Docker container. And I just have to say that um, I was really excited about Lizzie's talk yesterday. And I'm totally going to go home and revamp my tests. <laughs> um, so right now, we are just using the basic uh, built-in Sphinx tool set. Um, make HTML to build the HTML files, make link check to check all the internal and external links, and then we're using write good to check the grammar and style. So the, the nice thing about um, having the set of doc tests and requiring all of the developers to actually pay attention to them, these break the build. So no developer can have their code merged in with failing doc tests which is really awesome uh, for me, it, and it's really awesome for other projects that will be using this workflow in the future at my company that don't necessarily have a technical writer embedded um, and don't have anyone, <laughs> a tech writer or an editor, to keep them honest in terms of you know, following the style guide and making sure you're using active versus passive voice and all of those good things that the tests trip me up on continually. Ooh, OK. So this is, can you still hear me? OK. This is the uh, Travis CI deploy script that we use. Um, at the top there, you can see our uh, <laughs> secure credentials for AWS. So that tells Travis how to actually authenticate to the service to get our content into the S3 bucket. Um, we're, using, we're set up to use the Docker container inside of Travis. Uh, the script section runs the test scripts, and then finally the deploy section is what actually tells Travis to uh, deploy to our S3 bucket. Um, it's telling it where to pull the content from, where to send the content to. Uh, each of our projects is only allowed to go to its specific location in the S3 bucket, um, basically for security purposes. <laughs> and finally, um, the most important part I think, is this bit down here, which tells Travis, you can only deploy if you're on this branch of this repo. Uh, we deploy from a version branch. We do not deploy, uh, we not, don't limit deployments to tags, which is a key part of the um, continuous deployment model. And that means that if we have to fix a typo, we don't have to wait four months for the next release to come out to get that doc change into the documentation that the customers see. We just make the fix. We merge it into the release branch, and then we get on with our lives. 
So uh, as I mentioned, everything um, that is getting deployed is going into an S3 bucket, and that's uh, hosting a website that's called clouddocs.f5.com. It's brand new. We just launched it like two months ago. I'm really excited about that. Um, so the way that our documentation works is uh, many projects from many different Git repositories are all using con continuous integration to deploy to one single website. We have product documentation, which contains um, what all the engineers like to call the nerd knobs, the installation instructions, any you know, command line flags. I see you laughing at nerd knobs. It's funny. <laughs> um, I giggle every time they say it. Um, so it's, it's all of the command line stuff. It's all of the, the configuration information. Um, it is eventually we'll have API documentation, and that will live there as well. Um, the main audience for that sort of documentation we consider to be the developers. Um, so it's internal developers and then external developers who are going to be trying to integrate our products into whatever solution they're creating. Um, for solution documentation, that's more of a point A to point B, goal-oriented, task-oriented document that gives context to how the products work with each other. Um, because none of the products that we build are meant to just stand by themselves. They're all interconnected. And they're all interconnected with the flagship product uh, that F5 makes, which is called the Big IP. So none of these things exists in a vacuum which means it's really important to our customer that we give them context for how each piece fits together and how, e how those in concert can be used with the big IP. Uh, our main uh, user for that, the solution type of documentation, um, yes, it's customer documentation, but if we're being totally honest with ourselves, like it's mostly internal customers, which is um, F5 sales and support. Because while some of the customers will actually go to the documentation set and try to figure things out for themselves, they also are just as likely to just go to their support or sales rep and say, how do I do this? So my goal is to provide whoever comes and looks at the solution documentation with a very succinct and very clear path to follow. So I did mention collaboration. Collaboration is king. Um, <laughs> When I held my first training session for all the software engineers on our new docs process, I told everyone, you're all doc writers now. And it was true then, and it's true now. Because everyone who works on any of these projects is a potential doc writer. The key is having realistic expectations as to what different roles are going to be able and willing to contribute. I tell all the developers that they're not expected to get all of the syntax and grammar right. I mean, I don't even care if they write complete sentences. I just want them to tell me what they know. It's my job to distill that information into something a customer might, ac customer might actually find useful. So I help them change passive voice to active voice, and they help me create Docker images and deploy scripts, and everybody's happy at the end of the day. Um, everyone contributes in the way appropriate for their skill set, and the project is better off for it. So I did touch on having a clear picture of where you're trying to go before you get there. Um, that would have been really nice. <laughs> this is just a smattering of the different questions that we were trying to answer as we were developing uh, our docs tool set and publication model. Um, I know that versioning is on there twice. It's because it's the thing that we've talked the most about, and it's still not 100%. Um, but the, the most important takeaway here is that Yes, there are a lot of questions. Try to answer, answer as many of them as you can before you start. Um, but if you have to change directions or you know, figure it out as you go along, it's OK. Um, for us, the answers to some of these questions were um, we follow the principle of minimalism. That's an F5 TechCom standard. It's really great. Uh, if everybody here is probably familiar with it, so I'm not going to go into it in, de in detail, but it's it's very useful. Um, we write every page as page one topics. If you know every page is page one, if you like it, dislike it, um, have any opinion on, on it whatsoever, don't know about it and want to find out, come talk to me afterwards because I think it's the bomb. Uh, <laughs> we actually we got trained by Mark Baker. Um, my entire tech comms group in F5, we were the last training session he ever held. It was really awesome. I feel very lucky to have been part of that. Um, 
the product documentation versioning follows the product versioning. And uh, the solution docs have their own versioning. And honestly, that's the only way that we could do it without you know, just going completely batshit crazy. <laughs> we make minor doc version releases when new product releases come out. Um, so we can bump the release version in the solution documentation, but it doesn't have to be tied to a specific version of the product. And we don't have to have the same number as that product. Because there are so many different products, and there's only one docs website. So if you have to make changes to your process or strategy as you go, that's fine, because the process isn't the thing. Um, when something isn't working, change it. If there's a better way, use it. You don't ever want to find yourself in a position where you're saying, but that's the way we've always done it, because down that road lies mediocrity and possibly failure. Um, if you've always done it that way and it works for you, great, hunky-dory. Um, if it doesn't work anymore, be flexible enough to find a new way that does work. Because if you do that, <laughs> I just want to take, take a moment to appreciate this is a stock F5 um, image that we're allowed to use for our PowerPoint slides. <laughs> and what else could she possibly be saying to him but the information you need is clearly provided in the documentation? <laughs> It says, this image says it all right there. Um, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that it, the customer doesn't care how the docs got to the website. Um, they don't care whether you're de where you're developing them. They don't care what tools you use. And they don't care if the publication process is automated or manual. Um, they don't really care if you're using data topics or EPPO or RST or Markdown. They care about easily finding the information they need to get their specific job done and go home. Um, to us. That meant not hiding our documentation behind a login. It meant not pushing the tasks down the page underneath a wall of text. It meant developing the content in sets targeted at different audiences in ways that try to anticipate what that audience's specific needs are. But in the end, what matters is that you create the best possible experience for your users, because it's about them. Um, without them, we wouldn't exist. Um, when you do that, you might get this. And this is an actual quote about our new docs website from one of the F5 account managers. And I think this pretty much says it all. Um, I love this quote, but not just because it tells me that the content is great. I love it because it tells me that on the whole, our grand experiment is on the right track. If we're getting feedback like this from an internal customer, fingers crossed, we might get this type of feedback from an external customer as well. Um, because that's what it's all about. It's about giving the customer what they need when they need it, so they can do what they need to do and get on with their lives. Um, wait, wait, before you clap. <laughs> um, I really did just want to say thank you to everybody here for being such an amazing and inclusive and intelligent and wonderful community. Um, I have never been involved in anything like this before. This is my fir right, first Write the Docs. This is my first time presenting in front of so many people. And it could not have been any better than it was. So thank you all very much for being it's so, so wonderful. <laughs>